Um, hey, Travis. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> um, so I asked you to do this just to um, have a chance to hear your whole story because it's been really interesting for me as someone who's just known you in these little episodes over the last um, seven years, six years, um, through our coaching client relationship, um, to hear your, your life story and kind of what led you to go on this journey of seeking more out of life and, um, advocating for yourself and kind of combing the world to find what you needed for yourself. And it's really inspiring for me. So i um, wondering if you can just share um, what you remember from where you were back in 2011 when you found me and contacted me. Sure. Um, I had just spent, so some little background at the time, 2008, I moved to Hong Kong um to first time i really lived in asia and then i had come back and i was still wrought with a lot of depression um couldn't shake it and i took down i took a job because i had to because i needed some stability in my life still just wrought with a lot of um just a lot of depression i could barely go to work i would have to go take naps all the time uh it wasn't happy um but it didn't feel good and wasn't happy. That went on for another year. I went back, came back to the Bay Area. And then I just needed something. I just, it's the same old story again. Uh, my life was going nowhere. And I got to the point where over Halloween, or right after Halloween, I, I woke up in jail. And uh, I woke up in jail. And waking up is uh, not really waking up. I pretty much was out of my, um, became sober in jail. Because around two in the morning or something like that, I finally woke up. And I realized I had just um, crashed, totaled my car, drunk driving. Because the last thing I remember was I was trying to get two girls drunk so I could have a threesome. And then I remember, oh, wait, that same day I was, uh, I trained, was training for a marathon. So I ran like 16 miles and played a doubles tennis match. And those women would have been the fifth and sixth person would have slept with that, that week. And uh, as I was walking home from uh, getting, I was in jail, just sitting there, barely awake and sober. I couldn't believe that my life was turning in this. And, uh, I, and that happened about uh, five months before I, I met you and something like that. And I just thought, I can't, this is not the life that I ever designed, uh, even dreamt of, or even, and the, at that time, I could have been, uh, been in big trouble, in big, big trouble. Um, and so I, oh, I'm sorry, this was, I'm sorry, this was a year, this was a year before I met you, approximately. And, 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 and after, even after that, I was trying to make a lot of changes. So a, a year before that, I was trying to make a ton of changes, and I couldn't. I was still depressed or I, I would make sure I wasn't manic anymore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I just didn't know what to do. And did you, have a, do... did you have a job at this time? Sorry to interrupt. Yes, I did. So uh, at this time I made myself work, um, a tech job that I couldn't stand and it, I couldn't stand so much. That after one year I switched to another one. So, um, and so I was fully full time working the whole time when I was back in the Bay Area. Um, but it was making me miserable. Uh, that was just completely out of discipline that I kept the job um, and desperation. And every day I just felt desperate and, and I just couldn't figure out what to do. And I tried, I just felt really unmotivated, can't really heavy, just, just classic depression. And, um, I started looking online and say, I, I need something different. Um, because at that point, by that point, I was 30, 36, 35, 36 already. And I already tried many different things. Psychiatry or bipolar drugs. I tried shamanism. I mean, the list is outrageous. I tried tracking, um, like really like probably Excel spreadsheet, tracking sleep, tracking everything. 
I had tried exorcism. I have tried Reiki. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many I can think of. Hypnotism, um, so taking supplements, um, and they all helped. There's probably six or seven more that I haven't named. Um, oh, massage therapy, um, all types of stuff, just anything I can think of. And the somatic work did help. So I was looking for someone who can do something. And I was, I was on the hunt again, looking for something that can take me out of this. And I tried some executive coaches, some life coaches. You were about the sixth, fifth or sixth one. Mm. And then you did a dream analysis with me on the phone. And I was like, this is the right person. Mm. Because that first dream was about, it was some really bloody train murder. And then we, at the end of the session, this trial thing for 30 minutes, I realized how much it was about my family and it was so violent. I knew something was up and it felt like, whoa, there's something there. Mm. So that's, that's where I was at. And um, yeah, I was trying to find a way out of this rut and this depression that I couldn't get out of. So. Thank you. And as I'm thinking about that, um, <laughs> where I was at that time as a coach and in my life, I was just looking back at some of our first emails and I was like giving all these caveats, like, um, you know, it's not about going into the past. It's about being in the present. And I was sort of like parroting back these um, new age principles that I had been trying to incorporate myself. And um, I myself wasn't in touch with the, the impact of our childhoods and intergenerational trauma at that time. Um, it was about just tapping into something other than the the conscious storyline that we've been living by. So um, tell me about what, just kind of fast forwarding to like the end of that first period of time that we had coaching together, like what, what happened for you and what changed in your life after that first, whatever it was, a year or so? Um. Well, the end result was I, well, I, a few months into it, I started taking acting classes. Yeah. So that was a, that was one, one, one step up. And I was like, okay, I found, I found, I think we got to the point where I felt like, oh, that feels like shackles off. I think you taught me something like just to feel what might feel right. Cause I, I think we worked a lot on, I want to do something, be something. And it's something out there and something about media. Well, I don't know. So I, from, Working with you, I got enough courage and out of my funk to go take some acting classes. And I think at the very end, the reason we stopped was uh, I moved to Shanghai to try to be an actor or something and without knowing what the heck it is. And, and it got me over the hump to, to go. I never lived in China. And it's a scary place, especially because when I first saw it, you know, 2004, 2008, it was a rough place. I mean, it was a really rough place. And, and I just went there and said, screw it. Let's just, let's just go. I mean, I had been to Shanghai before. And, and I quit my job. Uh, mm. And I went to Shanghai. That, that's pretty much what happened. That's, that's the result. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I often inspire people to quit their jobs. I, I'm fine with that. Um, so, and so that was in 2012 or thir 13, something around there. That was in June 2012 when I moved to Shanghai. Okay. I remember that clearly. And then, so what's the summary of like from that period of time till when you contacted me again this January of 2018? Wow. Okay. So it's really hard for me to summarize because, yeah. uh, because I move around a lot and I have a lot of vignettes in my life and little short stories. So, pretty much for those uh, five and a half years, I tried out Asia, tried out acting, um, came back. Um, I got bounced back and forth between California and Asia two to three times as a summary. And something was there. I still didn't, couldn't find my way. I knew something about media is it. It just makes me feel better. I feel more alive. Um, and I, I couldn't stop going back and forth. When I go to Asia, I don't get anything done, but I feel better. Mm. And I kind of dabble in media, but not really get anything going. And then I come back and I have to make some money and work. And I go back to tech. And then essentially it goes back and forth like this. Um, and then I was going to turn 40 and then I kind of freaked out. And I was like, oh my God, I got to do something. And um, for two years, I pretty much lived off Airbnb. And this took it to another level. 
uh, instead of going back and forth China, or Asia, and United and California, I was essentially constantly moving. Mm. Uh, and I lived in Poland, Sydney. I don't know. I was vacationing here and there, and went to Eastern Europe, hung out, and and I took random jobs that were all over the place. Uh, I started. I ran a brand, a skincare brand. I did consulting for education. I did energy efficiency. I mean, it was all over the place. Uh, <laughs> made a viral video. Um, oh, the viral video in Shanghai was a key component because it was the, I swear at the time of my life, it was the, t- the number one high of my life. Mm. I've never felt so electric in my life. And I even went to some leadership seminar or some, something, some emotional training or something for about five days. It ended up being a cult like thing. But anyways, um, and I have to reenact a high moment in my life. And I did that and it was obviously the one. And, and so that kind of wraps it up. So I always use that as an anchor. Like, yeah, there's something, there, there was a moment at that time that there's something about that. I could never get back that high. Um, but let me just, and, let me just so. let you expand on that for people that don't know what that is. You, you created, acted in, produced and directed a video. Is that correct? Yeah. A, a three minute video, like a, it's a parody mm-hmm. and it's like I'm rapping and completely no value in goofing off. Um, and at the time in China, this was like six or seven years ago, YouTube, like the YouTube of China didn't exist because of the rules in China. No one shared videos. No one did their own videos. It was just starting out. Now it's enormous. It's actually bigger than the United States. But at the time, you know, and then I just thought, what the heck, I'll do this. And then I did it and uh, I, I got all, like 700,000 views at the time for in, within the first two weeks. And that was a lot at the time. And the stations were calling me and they're like, hey, who are you? Blah, blah, blah. Kind of like talent scouting. So that's kind of what happened. And the whole thing was a high, like, working on it, practicing it, directing it, filming it, editing it, and getting the result from the audience and getting the calls from the other people. It, it was, the whole thing was a big thing. So yeah, I, I, I kept that in my mind, but then I was still scurrying around and I realized by end of last year, which is before I came, in, uh, came back to you again, and said, so I need help. Because the same thing is happening, except I'm not depressed anymore. <laughs> that's the difference i i've gotten out of the most of the pretty much by then four in four years i haven't had an episode of like a actual episode of depression or mania that a psychiatrist would consider so it was i was already really like they were gone and uh but i was still running around i was still like lost and scrambling and didn't feel good still so i was like okay there's there's something wrong still and so and, that uh, brings, that's when you recontacted me and it was like early this year, early 2018. Yes. Uh, I think I was about to fly back for Christmas, uh, back to the United States. I was living in Asia and I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to spend a little bit more time in the U.S. and maybe I can contact Lisa and, you know, we'll see where she's at and like pretty much pick up where I was before. Mm-hmm. But this time I'm much healthier as a person. Yeah. And what was your goal this time? I remember the, do you remember the words that you used? Um... Oh, I wanted to, f- oh gosh, I can't remember. I think I said something like, I want to learn how to pursue something, a success or something I really want. Because I feel like I, every time I try to do that, the, some, something happens and it, it blows up. Mm-hmm. Like I just don't know how to do that because by then I've already tried it for 15 years of my life. Mm-hmm. So, so 28 was another big pivot. Then that was way before I, I met you the first time. And that was when I decided to get a divorce and completely change my life up and not follow what I was born into the way to live, to survive and be extremely frugal and be a good Asian immigrant son. Um, and, yeah, and since then I really tried to. Hey, it's this is what I want to live like, and I still couldn't figure out how to do it. I mean, that was kind of thinking in my mind. It's like I need help. So. Yeah, and that was well. I haven't asked you this, but what was, what has that been like as a, um, as an Asian American immigrant son to get all this help? I mean, you've gotten a lot of help, which a lot of people are 
stuck on the other side of getting none. So was that a big deal for you or was that not a big deal? Oh, that was a huge deal. I mean, I, there's so many ways I can say this. Why? Like the other people I knew, there, there was a, when I was in business school, I had an Indian friend of mine, different South Asian, but similar issues and also bipolar. He decided to keep on going on the big corporate track and there's a company called McKinsey that's really famous and all these everybody wants to do and then he got into startup CEO and you know there was a moment in business school where I quit and told him you know what I'm done with this crap um, like I'm not this is like I'm only like 30 or something mm -hmm. it wasn't too long after my divorce my divorce finalized in like 20 it was like a year and a half afterwards I was like you know what this is the wrong path I just know it and he kept on going that path and, and I mean 10 years later he was a mess because I think most people, the help that they get is the only thing that's available to them. And usually it's what their insurance covers. Mm -hmm. um, or, and then worse, yeah, some people have no help. Um, and I'm talking about even when I go get that type of help, it, it wasn't enough. And I didn't realize how important getting help was until I found the right person. And the first person for me was this woman named Emily who was supposed to be a massage therapist. Mm -hmm. And she started talking to me while she did massage school. Can I try something new on you? I was like, sure. <laughs> I'm in San Francisco and it's a pretty, you know, I'm a pretty open person. She started pressing on my stomach and asked me about my dad actually at the time and, pow and power. And then I was crying, like bawling for about 10 minutes. Mm. I can't even, and I was like, whoa, there's something here. Like I've never felt so relieved in my life. Mm. And then that's when it began. And then that gave me the uh, curiosity and the courage to, to think, hey, I don't, I don't have to follow, you know, the standards and, and what's only handed to me and what I can afford. I can look outside and see what, what's going on. And, and this is the first time I got into somatic, as a patient, somatic work. And at that time, had you already been in the system with psychiatrists and medications? And oh, yes. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I took my first medication actually when I was 13 years old because I had a grandma seizure. Um, and f for those who don't know, it's like grandma's, I mean, epilepsy and bipolar is really related. Mm. Uh, in fact, about one third of the medication for bipolar is for, in, for epilepsy, mm. for seizures, actually. Um, so I already took that when I was 13 for two years. I, I know how it feels like and I hated it. Um, I didn't think this doesn't do anything but make me not live and feel mm -hmm. dull. Um, so yeah, by, at the time, by the time I was, I saw Emily the first time I had already been to f f four psychiatrists. I don't know how many psychotherapists, maybe s six. Mm. Yeah. I've already been through, um, and been diagnosed with all types of stuff, depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. I don't know. Relationship dysfunction disorder. I don't know. All this type of crap. Yeah. What in you, what? So be, this is like way before we met. So there's something in you that didn't, wouldn't take those answers to be your truth. You know, you yes. wouldn't believe. So can you talk about that? Like, what was it like to hear these doctors, you know, these authority figures label you and tell you what you had? And then what, did, what was it like to hear that voice inside that said no? Well, I think the first time I, I can remember is... Uh, I was thinking about getting a divorce and had just married my wife at the time for only one year mm -hmm. and no one had done anything to anybody. And we were supposed to be happy because we had just bought a house with investment properties, yellow Labrador, SUV, <laughs> a car, I mean like everything, right? nice neighborhood in Austin. And I was miserable. Yeah. And then they tell me, of course, counselors would tell me, oh, no, 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 work on your marriage, work on your marriage. And then like, you know, this is not supposed to happen. Cause they asked me, like anybody cheat? I'm like, no, it's like, like this is something's wrong with you. Mm. I'm like, okay. Something's wrong with me. Okay. I, I get that. Cause I feel like crap. All right. Then they're <laughs> like, oh, okay. Okay. And then it's like, oh, we know what you have. You have anxiety, you have anxiety problems. Like, okay, try this. I'm, I'm open to it. I'm like, sure. If it makes me feel better, let's do it. And maybe I am messed up and I shouldn't get a divorce. And then I take those drugs and it's like, well, I feel great for about a week. And then I'm like, Oh, I don't feel, I feel a little bit better. It's almost like if, if uh, I broke my leg and you gave me a bunch of candy, it's like, I, I get it. I feel better, but it's not, 
there's still something going on that's painful. Mm. And then I go back and then I'm on this revolving door of different diagnoses. And when they diagnosed with bipolar and I read a bunch of books on it, um, I realized, yeah, okay, that's pretty close. I was like, that, that's a pretty good description of, of how I am mm -hmm. and how things have been. So I was like, okay, great. What are you going to give me? And then they gave me a bunch of pills. And then the one pill that they gave me was the same thing I took when I was 13 years old. I was like, wait a minute. You're not giving me a solution because that didn't fix me either. Mm -hmm. You're giving me candy to eat so I can forget about the real pain. And this went on for about two years. And I was like, I've had enough. And then I finally said, I'm, I'm going to get divorced because that's the real problem. And then what happens after that is I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, that, I knew I was right. I mean, like my heart was right. My, my body, like there was something about what I knew was right. Like that's the problem. It's not this other crap. So that's when I began to go, you know what? No more. I'm not listening to this. So. That's an awesome story of like, that, like just knowing that there was something inside you that knew and um, that and being open and also coming back to what you know. Yeah. Cause I just want to make sure, you know, what yeah. if they're right? Yeah. Right. But they're not. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. I think there's a lot for people to hear in that because, um, somehow you were not intimidated by the system and the authority figures saying this is what uh, what you should do that there was still a fighter in you or something i don't i don't want to call it fighter but there was something alive in you that stood up to that yeah i always i, I back when even i was a kid i talked back to teachers so yeah. it's that part of me yeah yeah That's yeah right. so um so tell me tell the people watching this what what has happened for you this past year? And I know this is pretty fresh and raw. And so um, I appreciate you sharing it like right in the moment. Um, but we're in September now and you and I worked together for about six months, right? Six and a half months. And I was personally exploring and playing with new modalities for myself um, using drama. And um, I thought it was so synchronicity synchronous to have you contact me right at this time when I'm exploring drama. And I knew that you had this history of doing acting and, and playing in that area, which I had never done. So um, that's just my perspective of where I was when we met. And I was like, okay, if you're like open to playing and we drew those cards and you got um, embodiment and play and trust, right? Those were the yeah, th I those, remember that. Those three <laughs> words. I'm like, okay, we're doing it. Um, so what happened for you in the last, since we, since we, uh, met again in January? Um, I, well, I'm going to start with just how I feel right now. Yeah. I feel, um, I think this is what people call in the moment M more so definitely than before. I feel things. I feel more natural, like things that excite me or something that excite me. It's like, yeah, I can feel it when I don't want to do something like when I go jogging, <laughs> this is actually a good thing. Um, when I go jogging, it actually hurts more now. Cause like, I don't have some other thing that's trying to like go keep on jogging, keep on jogging and some, something it's like, I'm properly motivated. It feels like everything is just like, I'm part of the organic whole. Like I'm just part of the system. Like there's no weird blinders or I'm not in some matrix. So I'm not, living some story like i'm just kind of me living me mm. i i think that's the biggest difference um and that's kind of the description of it consciously as a person i mean if you just look at things that um kind of like my body and, and my just my body because that's the body doesn't lie you can't fake stuff i can sleep when i was when i first came back to you i had sleeping problems and insomnia Mm. And then insomnia was a depression type or anxiety type where I could fall asleep very quickly, but I wake up after four hours. I can't go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And my sleep was very fragile. I was still, still taking sleeping pills. So now I don't take sleeping pills. I haven't taken it for almost four months now. And uh, I sleep and I wake up when I just sleep with the windows open and, and the blind only half down. Like the light used to immediately wake me up, but now I just kind of sleep when it's dark and I'm just kind of sleeping naturally. Uh, it's pretty resilient too, my sleep. So that's, that's huge because I, even when I had bipolar disorder, 
uh, the number one thing I, I monitor was my sleep because it never lies because mm-hmm. you can't control it. Mm-hmm. You can't fool yourself. If you're not sleeping, you're feeling like crap. Yeah. If you're sleeping, you're feeling good. It's just the way it is. So that's, that's the key indicator for me. Uh, so, um, and also I think um, I'm able to work is the second thing. Mm-hmm. When I came to you, you know, quickly, I think we were talking about making a living, all those worries and troubles. And I couldn't work without pretty much using whatever I knew how to keep me working. Mm. And that included smoking cigarettes. Um, that included, you know, piling down coffee in the morning, especially. And then another one in the afternoon, eating a lot. Uh, and then having to get into the cycle. Oh, I just ate a lot. I have to go work out. Mm. And then I come back exhausted and, un- and unsatisfied in every area. So that has pretty much gone away. I can work now. I've been working for the past three months uh, full time, pretty much, um, doing analytical things. That was the thing that triggered like this inability to work. And um, even though I don't really want to spend my life doing this type of work, the fact that I can go through it like a normal, like a normal, you know, just a healthy person. It's not your dream job. It's not exciting you, but you can go to work. It's not killing me either. And then you can come back and you can be happy that you made some money. So that is, has been huge. I think those two things have been the, those sleep and that has been the biggest kind of, uh, if you can measure it. Mm. And then I told you consciously what it what it's like. It's like if everything feels very natural and I can, I think it's what people call being more in the moment. Because I think a lot of things have gone away. Um, um, so that's kind of the change. And my experience through it is, uh, wow. I, so I, I did, um, I continue with somatic experiencing along with your, working with you on psychodrama and these other exercises you do, they're, probably closer life coaching where are you sorting things out for me like in a it, it feels more heady mm-hmm. uh, it's more about my life and uh, along with the psychodrama and these tasks that you give me and these tasks that i create myself like making videos of myself um it was really when i did that to be honest along with so so f- f- I mean, I got to remember that, you know, for the six and a half months, we were remote, like almost all of it, like f- five months, I think. Like we were on the, f- like I saw you on a little iPhone screen. Uh, and and you, also, were in, did... you were in China and I was in California. Just for yeah, people. that's yeah. right. And, and, uh, and I also didn't have somatic experiencing because um, th- they're not in China either. So, but, but a lot of the work, like that was sorting my life out and, releasing some understanding releasing some stuff was really important and then the somatic experience came in later and earlier this summer about three months f- three or four months ago was to kind of let the body catch up now because my i think i felt like some in some way my subconscious and my mind was ahead of my body this time yeah because i had unearthed a lot of stuff that that resonated so yeah like uh, the interracial trauma is real and that was something i i used to call like a like an echo, like a, you know, like a cannon that just got fired or thunder and you know, something's bad is coming or something, something's bad, but you don't know what it is. And, uh, well, identifying that was really important, uh, and feeling it. And the psychodrama, I think even through a little tiny screen, let me, I don't know the fact of acting it out and just live, reliving it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also not just reliving it, but also, future living it really does something uh playing different roles just really gets you back to what it was and uh and from that um yeah and and i did that while i was still smoking and working and Mm -hmm. you know i was barely working at the time i i worked 20 hours a week and and i had to rely on all this stuff i um yeah i think it was really crucial and and with there were several moments I remember that were really important. Uh, it took a lot of work and a lot of, it was running through a maze. It was like meandering through a forest to find your way and go, this is it. This is a spot. And you have to find several of them. It, was, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of time put into it and a lot of feeling. Um, and you have to trust it. Because like, oftentimes I didn't know, like, where is this going? Um, for example, I think we were going with my mom for about two months before the big moment of, oh, my God, it's my dad. Um, I thought that was that was pretty big. Um, and there were other things, like, I was thinking, oh, my God, I can't. I, I got to do this. I got to do that. And then I got to use tech. And I had this idea of how I'm an artist and I end up confusion. Well, you know, it wasn't. And then after I got over all these things, I was like, oh, this, I'm not, there's no confusion, actually. You know, I'm just this person and I want to do this. And I knew this a long time ago. <laughs> this is not that uh, but then I think when you release a lot of this, I don't know how to explain it, like these beliefs, subconscious patterns and feelings in the body and uh, thought patterns, they all collude to like lock something in. And when you can break it through all this, uh, then it's open to for you to re to really see what it is and you can redefine it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think for me, that the result of that, one was making a living. I can actually make a living now. It's okay. We worked on that for a long time. Like, I can actually make a living. It's You can separate that from, it's like, oh yeah, this is making a living. Um, and then this, because before then I thought anything I did that made money had to be it. It had to be my dream job too. And then I, the other one is, um, you know, what happened to me, like I'm just a small part of a family tree, essentially. Mm. Um, and this family tree is just a little branch of this more ginormous thing. And to really recognize that and see it and uh, feel it in its positives and negatives and what's happened and what, how my mom felt like, how my dad felt like. We did a lot of psychodrama with me embodying them. And then to think how it was for these other people who were also in these places. And I think that was pretty big. And go, oh, it's not just me. Then I felt the feeling of, this is not about me, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how to say it. It's a feeling. It's not, it's like I'm no longer locked into like constantly can only like tweak myself. Somehow everything just opened up and it's like, oh, okay. A lot of people have these feelings, like, then it's just kind of like, oh, okay, it is what it is, and you can deal with it better. Um, uh, I, and uh, and then we sort of some smaller things, but, um, you know, that those two things and, the, and dealing with my father pretty much being absent most of the time in my, you know, early childhood when he was just gone because he had to work, and then adult, you know, t pretty much 10-year-old and beyond, when he just was in a depression he couldn't get away from that he was gone emotionally and mentally mm -hmm. and i think i think that was uh while i couldn't get through my stuff and i knew that he was going through the same stuff mm -hmm. so i essentially became him and uh but didn't know it because i you know i don't know we tell ourselves these stories or we don't want to feel that and all these things got in there you know and the uh, getting rid of that like sorting through that and those three things really I don't know, it opened up the, kind of the moment for me. Uh, I'm just me now, I'm just living pretty much. Beautiful. Yeah, what I'm hearing there is that um, that connection to something larger that, um, you know, and I'm just kind of recalling how that all opened sort of gradually, right? Like we start with our own feeling. We can only start with our own experience and then it's sort of like, as we go farther and farther and deeper and deeper, then we can see this bigger picture. But if we, we don't, if we don't touch that place in us where it relates to us, like the big picture is this abstract thing, like in a textbook, right? Or a movie you saw where it's like, great, that happened to those people, but what about me? So it's kind of like we need the full circle of like our interior and how it relates to the bigger picture um is what i'm hearing and and it, it's also my experience of like realizing how i kind of put up the blinders to my own history as a way to survive and be american and then as i'm unearthing all of these 
specific experiences, all of a sudden it becomes this historical narrative of like many, many people who, you know, who created this moment for me. And, um, and I'll just say from my experience with you that these, a lot of what you said today is like, oh, wow, I didn't, you know, I don't, I didn't realize that you had made these connections in the session because the session sometimes just ends in a, in an emotional release or, or realization. And then you're processing after that, you know, it continues and I don't see that. And so you're making those connections. So it's really beautiful to hear for the first time in some cases, like how that happened for you. After. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of the, sorting out actually happened after the sessions a lot yeah and i would sometimes write you these really long emails <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. yeah so what are you just to kind of close here what are you um what are you planning to do now what's different about your life now other than um being able to work for a living which is great um what new what's new for you well one is i i'm going back to asia mm -hmm. um for the fourth time, but it's a little different this time, I believe. Uh, it's going to start out different because I us usually just jump over there and then go, okay, I'll figure out what to do yeah. when I get there. This time, actually, I know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to start a talk show um, in the southern part of China. Uh, it's going to be international audience. I was, I, I'm already like designing out. I just bought a camera yesterday, so I'm already setting up before I go. It's, that's the difference. Um, I'm actually going there uh planning out also instead of just jumping in there i, I have a plan on how i'm going to make a living as well and it's not an issue it's just okay um i also made the i call them agreements i didn't know what to call them i think what i'm calling requirements in life so there and i like the book the four agreements yes. and i like the idea of making agreements with myself mm -hmm. um and i wrote down like five or six agreements like you know for the rest you know who knows my second life who knows how long what, what it'll be these are the things i'm agreeing to myself that this is what i'm going to get um and that helps yeah. because it's on paper and and they're not uh they're not like they used to be you know it wasn't like a goal like i'm going to make a million bucks by the time i age blah it's not like i'm going to own this or or even something like lose weight or i don't know some it's not a they're just they're more about how i am so what, for example, one of them is, um, the first one actually is that I want to uh, max out my potential. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to feel that way. Um, mm -hmm. One. Mm -hmm. Number two is uh, most of the time I want to be in harmony with what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. Like my brain is in harmony. Like it's not painful to go. Mm -hmm. This is very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and there can be controlled and, it's, you know, and I wrote them down. Uh, I think that's the main difference. I mean, besides the obviously I can sleep and I feel better and all that stuff, but, uh, yeah, I, I have, I think that's the biggest difference. It's, I think the other thing that I, I would say would be, I feel, and this is pretty big. It might be even the top thing. That's the difference. This time I go, I'm going feeling not threatened and, Mm -hmm. and uh, nervous and desperate i feel safe mm -hmm. uh i think this is what safety feels like like there's nothing particularly wrong with anything uh I'm, i don't have to look out for the surprise mm -hmm. i feel uh and i can hear my own voice um i think i don't know if this is true it seems like the like my physiology has changed. Uh, like the, the nervous system, the, I think people call it the uh, central nervous system or the autonomic nervous system. I think it's different. Mm. It just doesn't swing wildly and so sensitive anymore. I think I've told you and some other people, it's like I used to have an alarm system. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know how when you like, those, you used to, you walk around and then some stupid car alarm just go off. Yeah. And it annoys the heck out of you. Well, imagine if I, I felt like I was walking around with that, but I got so used to that I couldn't even hear the alarm anymore, but mm -hmm. I reacted to it. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if I was always living like that and you don't know when it's going to go off and uh, 
and you react certain ways. Like you, you're nervous, you get desperate, you want to get out, you got to change something. Now it feels like that's gone. I mean, sometimes it comes up, and maybe then I can just go. Oh, that and it feels like a worry. It doesn't feel like something mm. desperate is happening. Um, I think that's. I think at the top level, that's the biggest difference. And going in and doing something you want to do, like pursue something I want, that makes a huge difference. I think finally, maybe that was the answer always. So, yeah. awesome. Thank you. Sure. And uh, I, I just, there's so much in there that is such a, a story of, you know, so many people's longing and, um, you know, wanting to know what they want. I think this is like something I hear from a lot of people that come to me or not, you know, in the world. So I, I just, I think your story is, I, I wanted to add it to the the canon <laughs> of stories available of human of real humans, you know, doing it, living it, finding their way. And um, I love that image of like wandering in a forest and, and having to feel your way around and, and identify like, this is it, this is it, you know, and it's different for everyone. There's no, there's no pre-made map for your life. You're yeah. making the map and you're, uh, you're doing it. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I mean, I'm here because <laughs> we spent six and a half months working on all this stuff. Awesome. So, um, great. So I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.